This morning's message is entitled Ordinarily Special. Can you say that with me? Say that with me this morning. Ordinarily Special. Ordinarily Special. And if you have glasses on or if your screen is not too small, you can see underneath it, it says the benefit of someone else's promotion. Ah, what's up, PC? Ordinarily special often occurs at the benefit of someone else's promotion. So we'll be in John 17 verses 20. 24. Now, this passage is going to talk about even though you're ordinary, you have to still see yourself as special. So if you look at the picture on the screen, you'll see how the butterfly is an ordinary butterfly but it is special because of its color. So it is not that this blue butterfly is any better or more heroic or endowed with super spiritual powers. It's just that it is ordinarily special. Hmm. Okay. So the drag line underneath says it is the benefit of someone else's promotion. And often in the context of promotion, our first inclination often is to hate that someone else made it and got blessed uh, instead of seeing the benefit of someone else's promotion. Because what we'll learn today is that someone else's promotion can make me special. So while the world is made up of ordinary things, there still has to be some specialness in it. Stick with me for a minute. Every day, scientists learn new things about places that initially looked ordinary. Hmm. But as they dig deeper and probe further, they find out there is a specialness to this ordinary <laughs> place. And so last week I preached about the big job. And while everybody may not be able to get the big job, there's still a lot of ordinary people who are special. Anything special starts out ordinary. Uh, watch this now. Anything special special starts out ordinary because ordinary is not quite a superhero. It can't quite fly. Special is short of divine. We are not God. We are not special in the sense that we were built or created with something more than the ordinary individual. No, we are ordinary. But God says we are special. So as the world yearns and longs for superheroes to cope with life, oh, I love this, God gives the world many ordinary special people to help make the world a better place. Marvel makes a lot of money because of its presentation of the Avengers. 
the League of Justice with Superman and Batman and all of these people created objects and men and women, Wonder Woman, who are supposed to save the world. They aren't real. So in this world of trouble and pain and heartache, when we look out the window, you're not gonna see Superman. What are you going to see? A world filled with ordinarily special people, hallelujah. I think we lose ourselves when we see others elevated and we all root for the top dog or we all want to be like the top dog. We look at people, we follow people on Instagram and Facebook and all these other social media sites and we look at their image and we want to be like them. All we want to do is just drive their car, have their look, go where they've gone. And consequently, we do tremendous damage to ourselves when we can't duplicate their success. When we can't duplicate it, we get sad and we get depressed and we look down on ourselves. But what if I was to tell you that for every person that gets elevated, there is something special that happens to me. Woo. So that for every person that I wish to emulate, for every person that is elevated, for every person that I see get promoted, something special happens to those of us who have been left behind. That something unique, something constructed and crafted specifically for us happens to ordinarily people and makes them special. I can remember learning this lesson in the corporate world that whenever I got promoted, the department that I was leaving was still going to exist and before I left to be promoted to the new department, I still had to make sure that things were in place for those left behind in order for those things to continue to operate smoothly. Watch this now. So before I left to be promoted, I had to make sure this department kept running. Oh God, you're going to miss it. So I've learned that a godly promotion doesn't just leave people behind to fend for themselves, but that they become special and they are special because it takes ordinary special people to fill the gap when people are promoted and to stretch for continuation. It takes special people to keep the ball rolling when something is removed. Listen to what I'm saying. When God chooses to give someone a big job, we celebrate it because it means there's a specialness that comes to those who are left behind. In other words, when I get promoted, somebody else is going to take my position. I have to promote, move, and shift people around in that department to make sure that no beat is skipped. Listen to what I'm saying. So last week I talked about big jobs, but not everyone may get the big job. But when someone does, there is a vacancy that occurs. And that means there is a place for some ordinary special people to keep the world running. Ah, God. There are people who get elevated to the masses and to numbers, but the world has to keep running, baby. Somebody still has to keep changing the diapers. They don't put all that on Instagram. They only put that they're in Cabo. They only put that they're in Europe. They only show all the finer things, but who's cooking? Now, who's taking the trash out? Come on, put that on Instagram. Show me, bro. You take the trash out. You're changing the tire on your wife's car. The oil is leaking. You are doing the day-to-day -day things that help 
to hold this world together. If everybody was a megastar, nobody would be doing the things to keep megastars in business. I got, I told you before about the substratum, those behind the scenes that don't get the recognition, that aren't appreciated. There's no award ceremony for them, but without them, the world wouldn't be ticking. Come on, somebody. So there are this, this Jesus in this text today. In today's lesson, I'm going to show you how Jesus got promoted. And while he got promoted, he prayed some pretty special, special things for some pretty special people before he took on the role. Check this out. Let's check this out. Look at John 17 verse 5. The text says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was before the world was. So the, he, Jesus is asking the father, he says, glorify me back with you to where I was. Put me back on the glory level that I was on with you before this old crooked world came into being. So today's lesson is from John 17. Watch this. Go with me a little bit. And the lesson takes place right before Jesus's hour of crescendo, the crucifixion and the resurrection. So we're talking about a period of time where Jesus is praying a prayer for special people right before he gets his promotion. And before he gets promoted, what is he asking? He's asking for the promotion to be restored to the glory he had before the world was. So he's asking for his status back. And before he goes, he prays this prayer for some ordinary people. And so John 17, 1, I'm not going to read it, but it begins with Jesus requesting God's glory for the outcome of his obedience to the cross. He says, I've been obedient. I came to this cross. I did what you asked me to do. Now put me back on my status. And verse 5 is Jesus saying, when all this is over, when all this cross is over, when I I raise myself up again. I want you to return me to my glory with you I had before the world was made. But before you do, ah, God, I'm giving you the context of the text. But before you do, or while you're doing it, I need you to do something for some ordinary special people I have come to know and love. <laughs> that's Matthew, uh, that's uh, Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, all of them, Jesus says, before you promote me, I have a prayer for those that I have come to know and I have come to love. So Jesus prays this intercessory prayer. You know, he's at the right hand. He prays this intercessory prayer for the people he knows he's about to leave behind. Behind. And for those of us who would one day be in the place that he's leaving, he says, I need to make sure that when I leave, that everything is copacetic. I need to make sure that everybody has what they need to keep the world running. I'm telling you that when Jesus was on earth, he destroyed disturbed things, he shook it up and changed it to where people were beginning to recognize something was different. So he wanted to make sure that when he left, that the world didn't lapse back into this aura of sin without an expectation that something was different. And so before he left, he said, I need some ordinarily special people to keep 
things at a status quo. So the disciples weren't divine. Peter wasn't divine. Matthew wasn't divine. They were regular men, publicans, tax collectors, fishers, Luke a doctor, regular ordinary people, but had a special call on their life. So the overarching theme of this text is his glorification, that this whole text is about Jesus being promoted. But the sub-theme is our unity. The overarching theme is his glorification, but the sub-theme is our unity. The ordinarily special people have to be one. So by glorification, I mean Jesus had been deglorified. That Jesus, when he came to earth, was a step down. Ah, God, I feel him. Jesus was deglorified. He took a cut in pay. He stepped down from his original platform form of glory with the Father and put on human flesh. He became ordinary man like us. That's why we know we can do some extraordinary things because Jesus did it in an ordinary body. So in glorifying God on earth, in the process, Jesus had been deglorified. I'm going to say that again. When Jesus came to earth to glorify the Father, he was deglorified in the process. What I'm saying is that sometimes when you're trying to make God look good, you look bad in the process and you become deglorified. So Jesus has to pray for us that we understand our ordinarily specialness. Somebody type ordinarily special. And so to glorify means to make look good again. It means that God, Jesus was praying, give me back my glory. Make me look like I looked with you from before. If you come down, let me just say this off the script, off the record, Lawanda. If you come down for God's purpose, I guarantee you he's going to lift you back up period, point blank. I want to tell somebody, if you've been deglorified by your job or by your family or by your friends, your neighbor or even your enemies, uh, if you're deglorified for God's purpose, if you're trying to do the right thing, I guarantee you this message is for you. But when we do get our moments, listen to me, we can't just leave. We have to pray that people are unified and that there is a spirit remaining that people can get into to carry on the work. So when God does lift you up, y'all. You can't just bounce. You can't just leave. You got to make sure that where you're leaving, there's a unity, that everybody's on the same page. Have a meeting with the staff. Have a meeting with the team and say, I'm going to be leaving. I'm going to be going to the 14th floor. Uh, I'll be a manager or a director now of operations there. And uh, I need to make sure you guys are on the same page uh, so that you can carry on the work. It is wrong for me to say, accept the promotion from God and just leave things in hellious capacity. It is wrong for us to say, God bless me, so to hell with you. Excuse my language there. But the glorification must lead to intercession. I'll say that again. Your glorification or Jesus' glorification, his promotion led him to intercession. God, that's powerful. So when you get promoted, it ought to lead you to some sense of intercession. He had such a heart 
heart for those he had come to know and to love. And if you were good as a supervisor in Department A that you were leading, if you were good, you developed relationships with that staff and with those team members. So it's shameful of you to just take your promotion without saying goodbye to the people you worked with for the last three and a half years. I'm preaching from the Bible. Jesus was 30 years old when he got into ministry. He got his disciples at 30. They walked with him for three and a half years. And so Jesus now says, I'm getting ready to resurrect and I'm going to be gone. I'm going to another place. He says, I want to pray for you before I go. (laughs) So since I'm no longer going to be here and the disciples will be, here's what I'm asking for them so that my work continues. Listen to what I'm saying. The work must continue. Ordinarily special people continue the work. How do you see it? How vital you are. So he says, make them one as we are one. In other words, let them participate in my glory. God wanted to make a group of ordinary guys special enough to represent him on earth after he went back to the Father. Do you remember John 14? John 14 says he's let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you so that where you are, where I am, there ye may be also. Do you understand? They were feeling some kind of way about Jesus' departure. And so let's watch how this plays out because it's pretty astounding for those of us who call ourselves believers and we just ordinarily special. So first, let's look at what Jesus prayed for us. First, Jesus prayed for our unity. Somebody say unity. Check this out. In verses 20 and 21, he says, I do not ask. Oh, Jesus. I love him. He's so so caring. This is Jesus praying on behalf of the people he's about to leave. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, talking about the 12 disciples, But for those also who believe, that's Joy, Shauna, Mama Cain, C.Y., Tabitha, Tony, Lou, and Grizz. He says, I'm praying not just for these 12, but I'm praying for those who believe in me through their word from what they preach. Then 21 says, why? That they may all be one. We continue the work by being one. He says, how? Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Let me clarify the audience. Uh, Who is the passage referring to? He says, clearly, I'm not just praying for the 12. He says, I'm praying for all believers after I go. He says, we know this passage refers to us because he clearly states that he is praying for us. So all of those disciples plus us are included in this intercessory prayer. So this context of ordinarily special includes you, boo, Jesus had so much care and concern for the world he's leaving behind that he prays for the active employees and for those who would be hired down the line. Don't don't miss this. He says, I'm praying for those who are on staff now, the 12, and then I'm praying for everybody who's going to accept Jesus in their heart along the... I don't remember the year when I got saved, but I got saved. And when I got saved, Jesus prayed for me that I would become one. So what is he praying? Don't just listen. So don't just see the other's demise as your opportunity. Some of us get excited. Oh, when somebody gets fired, uh, that's my opportunity. No, when somebody gets promoted, that's an opportunity as well. But we learned that the main element that Jesus 
focuses on for continuation of work is the unity of those he leaves behind. And Jesus knew that people would be sad that he was living, and this may cause some to quit. Oftentimes, when management changes, when leadership changes, people quit. Ah. So instead of just leaving, Jesus prays for their specialness. Ah. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but Jesus, thousands of years ago, prayed for your specialness. And that specialness would be seen in their ability to come together. What makes you special is your ability to come together. But what do I mean by that? Here it is. Check this out. This is a quotable. You are ordinarily special when you learn to be one with others. Oh, come on now. You are ordinarily special when you learn to be one with others others. So what God is saying is that I need a group of special people who won't be like crabs in a barrel, grabbing and trying to pull people down, but will see themselves as intricately woven, interwoven with others to complete the job. And so what's important to note is that in the crucifixion, the death and the ridicule, Jesus in the eyes of the world had become deglorified. So the world looking at Jesus who said the, the Jews were saying he was the Messiah, but to the world, he was just a man who got killed. And the fact that he had just been deglorified, so he was he was sitting there being deglorified in the eyes of the world. Well, he ain't nobody special. They just put him on on the cross. So he was going to be re-glorified and he knew that his no longer being there would make things a little dicey and tricky because the world didn't see him as special. He was just a man who got killed on the cross. So Jesus's way of making sure he was hailed as the true king that he said he was and not just the dying lamb on the cross was to give something special to ordinary people. So the one thing that he knew would shake the world with gravitas would be to show how the world filled with so many people, background, status, etc. could unite and become one. God said, I will wow the world that the power of my uniqueness will be displayed in the concentration of those who I leave behind, their ability to become one. In other words, you're not looking at five million people. You're looking at five million people concentrated in to one. But what does becoming one mean? And Jesus said, I pray that they be one just as we are one, me and you, daddy. So for us, being one is something like, you know, not agreeing on all things, uh, but acting the same way in love. In other words, we have all separate roles. We all do different things, but we operate the same way when it comes to love. So to be one means to get on the same page. And how do you do that with folk who you, they're different, they have different backgrounds. Well, you learn to agree to disagree. Being one doesn't mean we always get everything, see everything eye to eye the same way. But when it comes to matters of love and fulfilling the will of God, we on the same page. Jesus isn't talking about becoming one big church. Allow me to be theological for just a moment. And I know you will say, oh, this isn't inspirational, but you need to know the theology of the text in order to appreciate the inspiration of the text. So Jesus isn't talking about becoming one big church where everybody is all just, just one church and everybody, that would be disastrous. 
interest because one group of people would like one group of music. One group of people would like to hear the bells and the songs and come at this time and they would want to sit this way and they don't want to clap and they want blue robes and we want choir, we want solos, we want to pray. You can't get everybody in the church on that same page. So Jesus is not talking about a universal church in the world all in one place where we all go to the same building. But he's talking about having many different churches. He's talking about having a Methodist church, a Baptist church, a Presbyterian church. But when it comes to love, we all on the same page. You can worship one way. It don't matter. It's not going to affect my love for you. In other words, you can meet at Saturday at 2 o'clock. It's not going to affect how we love you. The one thing we can all agree on is love. And so being one is not agreeing on everything. It's just being on the same page when it comes to a goal or a purpose or a single outcome, character or standard of life. When you marry somebody, you got to have at least the same standard of life. You've got to have a similar concept of morality. Listen, you may not agree on all things religion, but you got to agree on how we treat our neighbor and our loved one. I wish families would get more respect for one another before their respect for religion. I know that some people treat you one way because of what they believe, but they fail to act the belief out in the context of love. I'm preaching. The text said, become one as the Father is in Christ and Christ is in him. And so we must learn joy to be in one another. That's what becoming one means. It means to get in to people. <laughs> Have you heard people say, oh, no, I'm not into you. I'm not feeling them. In other words, God is saying we've got to get into people. We've got to get inside them and they have to get inside us. So get into what they're into. In other words, find a group of people you can relate to per se, where you can get into what they're thinking. And so listen, I'm telling you, y'all, I'm telling you, that's why many cults are established. They find a group that are doing the same things. On the surface, that is a good thing. It is a sense of specialness where people can come together with the same concept of mine, and Jesus was praying that we would be cohesive. But there's a second part to that, and we'll get to that in just a second. But being one isn't just being in the same place logistically, but it's being of the same mind. Because you could say, oh, we got a big church. Oh, yeah, we're one. Yeah, we got a big church. That doesn't mean you're one. You got 5,000 people in that church, and everybody's thinking a bunch of different crazy stuff. <laughs> but when people come together and are of the same mind, that's where God said the specialness comes in. God said, don't just convene to be convening, but convene to come together. Uh, don't you remember the 50 in the upper room who were waiting for the Holy Spirit? It wasn't until the text said that they got on one accord, that's when the Spirit fell. So you can have parties and gatherings all day if you want to. You can call them church. You can call them revivals. You can call them festivals. You can call them holy oil healing services and all that. But if people are not one on the same accord, you will not see the specialness that God placed in you to continue things on earth. Um, let me make it a little more practical. Allow me for a moment. The United States is called the United States because 50 states have agreed for the most part to follow a set of governing rules to be what? In the United States. Uh, to make a state, to bring a state in the United States, watch this now, in other words, in order to be in someone, in order for us to be in with one another, we have to agree to a set of rules. God, are you missing this? To become one means that we agree to a set of governing rules. So on our currency are the words, in God we trust. Not, not for God we trust, not to God we trust, but what? In God we trust. In other words, it's supposed 
goes to suggest that by being in God, we have decided to obey his rule. But that ain't quite happening, is it? And what Jesus wants us to learn that just being on the same page isn't enough. Being able to draw massive crowds of like-minded people doesn't mean you're special. So Jesus prayed the second part of the prayer that we would be one, watch this, in him. So God says, first, I want you to be one in one another, but now in one another, you've got to be one in me. Ah, uh, watch this now. So Jesus prayed this second part. It's not enough just to be fulfilled. You have to be unified in something. I'll say it again. You have to be unified in in something. In other words, the marbles are scattered all over. Let's bring all the marbles together and put them in the bowl. Oh, the specialness comes when you can come together and get in the bowl. Look at the text. The text says in verse 21, it says, the second part, he says, that they may be all one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be, read it with me, in us. We've got to be in the Father and in the Son so that the world may know that you sent me. So look at the underlying context that the promotion, he says, I need to leave this in place so that the world can know that you sent me. So what does it mean to be in God? God is saying we must be one in one. I'll say that again. We must be one in one. One. So we as a collective body of believers must be one, but we must be one in the one. So people often brag about the fact that they are one or we united or, or we a family. Yeah, but you a family in what? You just a family. That's why you have no power. That's why you have no authority because you're just a family. A family that doesn't agree to follow anybody's rules is just a family who is combined. I don't want to be join to anything that's just a joining to be where everybody is. I want to be where everybody is, but we are in something that is higher than us. So watch this now. So we as a collective body of believers must be one in the Father. Well, how do we become one in the Father and the Father in us? By his Holy Spirit. So we get in people by his spirit. We get in God by his spirit. His spirit gets in us by his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives where? In us, right? So when he comes in us, then we are in God. Watch this now. So when we come together as a people, the only way we get in God is to turn our physical, logistical, natural combination as coming together into something spiritual enough to go up to where God is. Ah, oh, God. So listen, I don't need your clarifications, your wisdom, or your intellect on earth. That brought us together. But in order in order for us to be together with purpose, we must turn our intellect, our ingenuity, our education, and our backgrounds into something spiritual that reaches up to get into God. And so the Godhead is one. Watch this now. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So we learn how to be millions, but we are one. Well, how is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit one and being three. They are one by spirit because God is spirit. So the Holy Spirit keeps them all combined. Watch this. What am I saying? So God the Father acts as a spirit. Jesus always does what the spirit says. The Holy Spirit does what the Jesus says. So in other words, when they operate spiritually, they always function the same way. Father has a different role. Jesus has a different role. Holy Spirit has a different role. But when they operate, in the spirit, they're all on the same page. What am I saying? I'm saying that when we come together and we find
behind our collective purpose, we turn our activeness, our actions into spiritual modes where our spirit, and listen, in other words, we're operating as a church all over the world with the same spirit. Well, what is that spirit? The spirit of love, the spirit of life. That spirit then creates that unified power of the body that makes us special because not only are we combined as one, but we have molded into a spiritual intellect. Uh, this might be too deep. You might not be getting it. I, I'm, I'm, I might be preaching ahead, but I think highly of you. That's why I'm giving it to you. But we turn our ingenuity, our passion, and our creativity into something that is spiritual and special. And God says that you are able to be you an ordinarily special when you come together and you make that kind of connection. So watch this now. You then, the second part is you are ordinary ordinarily special when you can be into others while still being into God. I got to say that again. You can be into others while still being into God. Let me talk right here to you, Cynthia. Those of you who brag about being able to be together, listen, those of you who find a man and you find a woman or you find something now you're into, right? I've been to the gym. I go to gym seven days a week, but you go to gym seven days a week, but you can't be into God. When the gym takes you away from God, you've lost your specialness. When your honey boo makes you stop going to church, you've lost your specialness. The goal of specialness is being able to be into one another while you stay still can be into God. Oh, I'm preaching, I'm teaching, I don't know which one. But I'm telling you that the specialness of your life is when you are able to be into one another. I love joy, I like kissing joy, but if joy don't love God, we got a problem. We need to be able to turn the kiss we have for one another into kisses we have for God. We must be able to, as a family, love God. When I see her lifting her hands, I need to lift my hands in agreement. When I go to worship and prayer, I don't care where they are in the world. Joy is with me. My daughters are with me. My son is with me. We all collective. When I pray, I pray for all of them. Why? Because we're not only into each other, but we're also into God. And I need my children to understand. Listen, I love you, but I'm into God too. And if you want to love me and you want our relationship to be rich, you've got to be into God as well. And I told you, I led all three of my children to the Lord when they were babies. And I'm depending on God to keep them. I'm depending on God to keep them as one as we operate together. So he's saying, I'm going to make you ordinarily special, but for me. So in other words, you're not just ordinarily combined for you. God didn't give you a boo to be happy for you. He said, I gave you the boo so the two of yous could be into me's. I'm saying yous are important for me's. So we've got to cut. I feel like we've got to be conscious enough of our oneness and that God has brought us together to glorify God. Remember, the whole point is to get God, Jesus, back to his normal status. So he's saying then that being unified for the wrong reason is nothing more than a coup. <laughs> oh, you can get people together for the wrong reasons and those are debacles. So God says, listen, when people are promoted, you don't just leave people behind to form coups. You don't leave people to their own intellect to form coups because coups like to take over. God said, I didn't ask you to take over. I didn't ask you to run the kingdom. I didn't ask you to worship. Do you know that some people have the audacity in relationships to say, I want you to worship me? You fool. You must be out of your mind. I wish I would worship you. I wish you would worship me. We worship God. Come on. I'm talking to somebody. Nobody going to say amen. Let me look at my, so anybody say amen. Listen, 
The way we get in God is by his spirit. And so to be one in God is to agree to obey the rules he gives us. It is people all over the world getting on the same page in God. Right now, people are preaching in Japan. People are preaching all over the world in Europe and the Netherlands. People are preaching all, and I'm believing that we are on the same page because they should be preaching love. It doesn't mean that we all do it the same way. It just means that we are all pledging to obedience to doing it God's way. Not necessarily how we do it, but doing what he wants us to do. So God, we agree God wants us to love him, love our neighbors as we love ourselves. How you do it? That ain't that ain't the issue. The issue is, are we in agreement on loving God, loving others, and loving ourselves. So when I join someone's club, I obey the club's rules. <laughs> I remember when I joined the Spectrum Club. There was this fitness center uh, back over there on Redondo Beach or Manhattan Beach Boulevard or something over there. And there was a specialness, I felt like, when I, because the celebrities went there. And it was a celebrity that took me there. And then I got hooked. I said, I pay my own money now, celebrity. I'll go here when you ain't even here. They used to have to take me. I had to go on the guest pass. But after a while, I got my own pass. And I said, now I'm a part of the club. Woo! I want somebody to see that you're ordinarily special because you're in the club. Well, what's the club? You're in God. You are in one another and you are in God. Woo! You are in the club. Yes, it's special to be one with others. Have you ever been kicked out of some place because you weren't in the club? Come on. God is not going to kick you out. The devil can't kick you out. You can say, I belong here. No weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. But when you can be into others while you are into God, that makes you special. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, when you can learn how to go to the party, hang out with your friends. I ain't got no disrespect and you ain't disrespecting me because you playing Snoop Dogg or you playing a, a, you know, a whoever, Tony Braxton or Chris Brown or whatever it is you playing. That ain't doing nothing to my holiness. I'm into you. I'm here supporting your baby shower. I'm here celebrating your son's graduation. You sir, serving cake and barbecue. I'm definitely there for the food and I'm telling you I'm here for it I'm into you but what you must understand that when things start going left I'm not only into you but I am also into God and when it starts going awry from what God wants me to do then I must leave thank you Danny McPhee so whenever things start changing that takes you away from God you've got to make the decision to say I am into you but I'm also into God is anybody getting that second aspect so that's what makes us special and God's word is his spirit the word says in John 4 that his word is spirit so when we get into the word watch this now when we get into the word we get into God as the word gets into us how by the spirit so all three of the Godhead are present so how do we become one and one in God? By reading his word, by following his word, by agreeing to obey his word. Sometimes when me and Joy have an argument, we fighting from the flesh. And she's fighting for her end and I'm fighting for mine. I'm there, but you ain't seeing it my way. You ain't, she's there, you ain't hearing me. And, but you ain't hearing me. And neither one of us hearing each other. And then the escalation goes up. But then we decide. Somebody gets a great idea and say, well, what does the word say? <laughs> and then we pull out the Bible or we quote a scripture and we say, well, uh, uh, well, we both wrong, right? Come on, talk to me, John. We both wrong. <laughs> and so we have to both pull back because what we have decided is we are into one another. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but before I'm into you, we are into God. And what God says, that's what we govern our lives by. We govern our lives by the word of God. And so for you families who are combined together, but you don't read the word, you ain't nothing but a coup because you you have to live by the word. It's like knitting uh, knitting up into the Father and 
son. We are all connected in God, all in the same yarn and fabric. The Holy Spirit is knitting us together. Me and Joy and Whitney and Nish and Cherry, all knitting up into God. We're a fabric that's combined together. We're connected to the Father and the Son by His Spirit, and God keeps us unified. It's like what makes the Whopper the Whopper is the ingredients. The Whopper is the Whopper, but it's the same. The tomatoes is a tomato. Lettuce is a lettuce. Ketchup is the ketchup. The meat's the meat. Those are all the same things. But what makes the Whopper the Whopper is when you see the Whopper in the franchise of Burger King. If it's not a burger in Burger King, you'll say it's just a sandwich. But what makes the tomato, the lettuce, and the pickles, you can have all of that on your own burger. But what makes the burger a Whopper is that the Whopper is in Burger King. What makes you special, what makes you ordinary is that you're in God. You have the same problems everybody has. You have the same drama everybody has. You have the same pickles and lettuce, tomatoes, everything everybody has. But what makes you part of God is, or the uniqueness is that you are in God. We keep the same rules. We keep the same rules. So remember, in the world's eyes, many believe Jesus was deglorified. And even Peter went back to fishing after Jesus rose again. People's dreams were crushed. So Jesus wanted some ordinary, some pretty ordinarily special people to let the world know he is who he said he is. And so how do we do it? Become one in one another. Peter, John, y'all get into one another. Y'all get into one another and then turn all that up into me. I'll make you special. And he wants the world to know he was sent by God. To be a group of people not in God is to be a people that won't register Christ coming to earth in their actions. If people can't see you together, if people can't see you working together and loving one another, then they won't see Christ on earth. He unifies us so that when we act, we do his will and the world knows that it's from heaven. God doesn't want you acting your own play out. He wants you acting his word out so that the world will validate that he was the one the father sent. So let's look at this last little bit of specialness. Jesus prays for us and I'll let you go. The text says that they may all be one, even as you father are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22 says the glory which you have given me I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. Ooh, so they get the glory. We get the glory too. He says, I in them and you and me that they may be perfected, completed, full in unity. Again, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. So the goal of our being one in one is to make sure the world knows that Jesus was sent by God, not just a man. So I'm trying to get you to see that we must be one in the one. And in that unity, the world sees that the father sent the son. So Jesus is divine, but we at best are special. I don't want anybody to think you are divine because you ain't, you're not. Your poop stinks. You got problems. You might go through a foreclosure. You might lose your house. You might lose your marriage. You might lose your job. You might lose your money. That makes you ordinary. But in the ordinariness of life, Jesus's promotion got you a prayer. And that prayer he prayed in John 17 makes you special. And when the world can see that Jesus was sent by God, that's what gives him glory. So when we're one in the one, the world sees that Jesus is who he says he was. That gives him glory. 
So our unity leads to glory and glory simply means making God look good on earth. So when we're one together, one in him, people see that Jesus is who he says he is. In other words, our lives make God look good. That's what glory is. We make God look good on earth. How? By being into one another while we're still into God. So as in verse 22, Jesus said the glory he had, look at verse 22. He says, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. So as in verse 22, Jesus says the glory he had, he has already given to not only the disciples, but all who would believe their words. We already have been given his glory. The text says we've already been given. His. In John 17, he prayed that we would get the glory. He says, the glory which you gave me, Father, I gave to them. So in other words, watch this now. If I'm promoted and I leave this department, guess what I leave behind? I leave keys, I leave badges, I leave passwords, I leave access, I leave strategies, I leave plans, I leave documents. In other words, I leave them everything they need to make that department look good. I'm gonna stop right there. I'm gonna stop right there. The glory he had He's already been given to us. So this is our point three. You are ordinarily special when you're able to make God look good on earth. When you can keep the job going, when you can make God look good on earth by just being you, ordinarily special, combined, unified into one, unified into God, you're making God look good. The glory you gave me, I have already given them. Now watch this. The glory Jesus is referring to is the glory of the cross and the resurrection. Because remember, Jesus was praying, let me have the glory I had with you before the world was. Jesus is getting the promotion. But Jesus leaves behind the glory he had from dying on the cross and rising from the grave. So what kind of glory do we already have? We don't have the glory of going back to the Father before the world was. We never had that glory. But the glory we do have is the glory to make the world, make God look good. How? While we're dying on the cross and while we're raising from the dead. I'm telling you, God says, I've already given you the glory glory to be able to go through people killing you, go through people crucifying you, and go through being raised from the dead and people uh, doubting you. I'm telling you that there were people even after Jesus was raised said, oh, he was, he was a myth. It wasn't real. Jesus says, I've given you the same glory to be able to handle whatever you're going through. And God says you are ordinarily special when you can get through your cross experience, when you can raise up again from the dead, you have the same glory I have. And I, Jesus said, I had the glory to make God look good by dying on the cross in obedience. I made him look good by sticking it out and I made him look good by overcoming death when I rose from the dead. You've got to make God look good by going through what you're going through and you got to make God look good by getting promoted when it's your time to get up. You have the glory to do it and I dare you to quit and give up on God when God says I've given you way back in John 17 the glory you need to make it through whatever you're going through. I've given you this glory because your job is to continue, to continue the redemptive plan. The glory that Jesus was looking for, the glory that Jesus was looking for of verse five, what he had with God before the world was. We don't get that. So he leaves them with the ability to look good out of whatever they had gone through. And just write this scripture down, note it, Shana or Joy, Romans 8.30. Romans 8.30 says the believer has already been glorified. We have already been glorified. So I am destined to come out of this. Whoa, you hear me? I am already declared to come out of this. 
Why? Because God would not allow you to go through what you're going through and not come out of it because it would make him look bad. So God says, in order to keep me looking good at a world that already doubts me, I need for you to win. Is anybody getting what I'm saying? And so the unity around the mission will make them one as we are one. And we rally around the mission of the cross. So all of us, we're here online, Lawanda. We're here online, Sharon. We're here online, Joyce. We're here online, Jonna. We're here online, Lou. Because we can all relate to trouble. We can all relate to heartache and pain. We can all relate to our own personal crucifixions of people backbiting and backstabbing us and the people that we have hurt. We've done wrong and we can identify. But there's a few of us who are online who can identify with the resurrection. We can identify that the Lord came through right at the ninth hour and he turned it around. There's a few of us who know what it's like to lose a job and get a new one. There's those of us who know what it's like to be divorced and then find the woman of your dreams or the man of our dreams. Some of us know what it's like to get a job that pays triple what we used to make because God says, I'm not going to let you go down without bringing you up. We all know when we combine together because we're all recipients of glory. See why you better show your glory. You better show your glory. Make God look good. Yes, you lost your mom, but make God look good. Some of us have had tragic situations, but we still have been given the glory to make God look good. So how is this spiritual unity perceivable by the world? How do we show the world that we've got a glory and that we're special? It must not be that we believe the same things and we just stay in our closets at home, but we must unite in physical and doable actions and living cooperation for the good of the world. It's one thing to tell my wife I love her every day, but if I don't show her, I'm going to be kicked out the house. This is what visible and tangible is seen to the world. It is our love for one another. God says they shall know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. The world can't see what we believe, but they can see us act out what we believed. The world can't see what's in your brain and in your heart, but they can see it when what's in your brain and your heart comes out toward them. Christianity becomes special when it doesn't act as the world acts, but it is able to engage in ways the world doesn't recognize. And I'm telling you, Tabitha, now is the time for our ordinariness to stand out. Why? Because it don't take a whole lot to stand out in this world today. Because today, simple acts of kindness, simple acts of forgiveness. Simple acts of love are really heightened now. Why? Because negativity, hate, judgment, and anger is so normalized now. All you got to do is just help somebody cross the street. Buy somebody a cookie. Something simple. Oh, that'll make you stand out. Why? Because the bar has been brought so low. Jesus says if you just do something nice in the world, that's how the world will know that I have made you special. So the unity God wants with us is the same unity Jesus has with his father, meaning he does exactly. Jesus does exactly what the Father wants. He does it just like his Father would do it. And when this kind of unity occurs, the Father and the Son can say they are one because whatever the Son does is just as the Father did it. In other words, when I send a representative to represent me, I send them in with the same authority because I know they're going to do it just like I told them to do it. That's what makes you one. Sometimes when they're asking for me, I can put Joy on the phone and say, that's my wife. She's got the same authority. She can answer all your questions, and I trust she's going to do it just like I said do it, or just like our family has agreed to be done. That's what makes us one. When we show up and we do it the way the Father says do it, we should be able to act in a way that my coming to the hospital to pray is just like your bishop coming to the hospital. You going to the hospital to pray is just like Jesus going to the hospital to pray because you're praying in Jesus name you're praying how he taught you you're one in God and you're one in one another I'm telling you we've got to learn how to come together and exhume the power of God in our lives showing love to people in the world and now for my concluding thoughts to this passage in 17 the text says father in 24 this is sweet 
This is beautiful, he says, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. I feel like jumping up and jumping around like a grasshopper. He says, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus has asked that we would see his glory the one he gets from the father that he had before the world was made Jesus prayed that we would be there to see him shine he says I want them to see me in my promotion he wants us to see him in his glory that he had with the father before he came to earth he doesn't want us to have our last memory of him on the cross as the dying lamb or the raised up lamb. He wants us to see him in all of his power and glory. And none of us have seen that yet. Our glory of God is interrupted. It's interrupted by the loss of a job. It's interrupted by a sad pain in our back. It's interrupted by a car being repossessed. Whatever glory we see God in is interrupted by trouble in our marriage. But God said, show them my glory where it don't stop, won't stop, can't stop. I want them to see me shine and I won't stop. Because the kind of glory God has over there, there is no need for a son. The Bible says he will be the son himself in revelation. So in finality, you are ordinarily special. When Jesus himself requests your presence at his new office, when your boss, old boss, gets promoted and he asks you to come up to the penthouse to see his view from his window, that's what Jesus prayed for you. That where I am, there you may be also. So when you are in God. You are also in his promotion that whatever he inherits, we inherit too. Jesus wants to personally remind us that it was all worth it. He says, come to my office and see why I didn't come off the cross. See why I didn't fight back. See why I stayed in the grave for three days and then got up. I want you to know that what you're going through is going to pay off. It should remind us that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. It may knock you down, but you will get up. I have never used this scripture as a validation of heaven, but I saw it for the first time in this lesson. The passage says every Christian who dies goes to heaven because Christ prayed that this might be so. The text said in John 17 24 he said I desire that they be able to see me in my glory with you before the world was made what he's praying is when every soldier dies I want them to come to heaven well where is Jesus seated at the right hand of the throne where is his office it's up in glory look up into the left when you learn that God says I prayed for you to come where I am he's saying I want you to see me shine. God wants our unity and participation in his glory. So to all of you who feel left behind, all of you who feel forgotten about, he wants you to know that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never be promoted and leave you in a place without making sure the work continues. You're going to work. You're going to find a job. You're going to find a place. You're going to be healed. You're going to find a boo. You're going to be loved again. You're going to straighten out because God doesn't promote and not let you continue with your life. Somebody says continuation. Ordinarily special people are able to continue 
continue the work that God left behind. God didn't leave you broken. God didn't leave you for things to stop. He left you there so you could realize you are ordinarily a special person and special people keep it going. 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 You're the one who he needs in this period of transition to keep his word alive. So you feel the pain, but keep praying, son of God. Don't you dare quit or give up just because things change. Things change so things could continue. Oh, change is an opportunity for you to shine because what people appreciate most is when things keep working, when logically everything should have fallen apart. I'm telling you, it is amazing when something that should be broken still works. I'm amazed when I used to get in my old bucket and the car shouldn't have started, but it started. I'm telling you, the world is amazed when you keep coming to work smiling and your husband left you yesterday or your child died last week, but you keep coming smiling and giving God the glory. It keeps on working. Even though the doctor said you don't have a lot of time, you're still alive now because it keeps on working. Special people keep it working. Special people keep it working. Special people keep it working. God used you to shine and hold things together while he is holding you together. Remember us in him and him in us. So while you hold on to him, he's holding on to you. So keep on flying. Keep on serving. Keep on working for God. For today is God's promotion. But it's his lifting you up into ordinarily special. Don't you dare quit. Keep it going. Keep it working. Keep it grooving. I know they took your money, but keep on believing. Keep on trusting. You gonna eat some kind of way. You gonna eat some kind of way. God will provide. Late in the midnight hour, God's gonna come through. Keep on smiling. Get in that broke down car. Keep on driving. Driving on fumes. But you gonna get to where you gonna get to. I don't know how he did it. But God healed me. God turned it around. God fixed my situation. I believe him and I trust him. Why? Because I'm ordinarily special. And these are the benefits of somebody else's promotion. I'm PC. Woo! And that's all I've got. <laughs>